All right. Uh, thank you all for joining with us today, uh, Salesforce Singapore Marketing Cloud Bootcamp. And uh, today uh, we have a, a very good topic. But first of all, thank you very much for joining with us today and uh, learning something great on the marketing cloud. Uh, we have our couple of housekeeping, housekeeping roles. Uh, during the session, you could leverage the chat box. And post the session, you could just use this link or you can scan the QR code for us posting any question that you know you would like to ask with us. And all the recording sessions have been updated. Uh, you can go through uh, the YouTube channel, Salesforce Singapore Marketers, and then you can scan this QR code as well to access all the content of uh, existing recordings. And for future sessions, so we have a future sessions which are conducting. There are plenty of sessions which are going uh, in the next couple of weeks. I could just use this link or you can scan the QR code for uh, registering with the future meetings so the sessions yeah starting from uh next week or middle of the next week so we have five sessions on every day starting from feb 14th because we have uh we are conducting cdp as a separate series from feb 14th here so every tuesday and wednesday every tuesday and wednesday we have a cdp session and rest thursday saturday sunday we have normal salesforce marketing cloud bootcamp content builder contact builder analytics and all the stuff so this is how we would love to complete the entire content by August or September uh, with all the marketing cloud uh, products. So keep looking at this and then try to register all the all this events and then so we can learn something good. So without delay, so uh, today our episode, Salesforce Marketing Cloud Data Uploads, and we're going to have some introductions and then I'll hand it over to Akash so that he'll go through the entire uh, process of different uploads in marketing cloud. And we can talk about a couple of resources, Q&A, and we can discuss about the next session details and the quiz as well. So here are our organizing team, Abhishek, Vishal, Prashant, and myself. So we are conducting an event which definitely is going to be helpful for all the trailblazers who are part of this community. And uh, and we're really looking forward to see everyone in this bootcamp and they learn something which is really beneficial for your career as well as to grow your digital portfolio as well. All right, so I'll hand it over to Akash. Uh, so, Akash is one of the marketing cloud best in minds, and he's one of the true trial based as well. And without any delay, I'm going to ask Akash to share his screen and then introduce himself. Thank you. Over to you, Akash. Thanks, Vani. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you find an option, Akash? Share screen? Yeah, uh, I just have to give a uh, screen share access. Uh, just a second. So, so meanwhile, I ask a couple of things. I think the winners that, you know, for the last couple of sessions, so we have sent our certification notices to their respective email IDs. So request to check your email IDs for the winners for the last couple of sessions. And if anyone has any troubles or anything that you haven't received, uh, just reach out to Prashant or myself. So we'll sort it out in uh, separately or offline. Hey, Fanny, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Akash, I can hear you. Let me give you uh, the co-host so that you can share your screen as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, now you are able to share your screen.
Uh, can you confirm if you are able to see it? No. Um, are you using Mac? Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you do one thing? Just click on share and then uh, uh, go to yeah, share. You can share your entire screen as well, or else you can share your tab as well. Uh, yeah, I am trying sharing the entire screen. Um, You're seeing an option for a share screen, right? A green, a green color icon. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Any, any other issues, Sakash? Uh, uh, yeah, let me try reconnecting again. What you can do is, I think uh, maybe you could restart your Plappy and then uh, yeah, sure. And then try again. We'll wait for a couple of minutes here. Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. I'll join back. Uh, no worries. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, audience. I think Akash will restart his Plappy again and then he'll reconnect once again with us. So meanwhile, I think if you would like to discuss anything, probably you can discuss as well. If anyone has any questions or anything, so you can you can go on and discuss accordingly. So, how do you feel the last couple of sessions? So, is there any improvement required from our side, or you would like us to continue with the same thing? Uh, it's open to us. Uh, you can just give your feedback, honestly, so that we can improvise ourselves, and you know we could come back with great content, have a great you know skills as well. Yeah, for so far it's good and useful. On the All right, thanks, Indraja. So just let me know if anything that we would love to, you know. Uh, yes, one question from my end. So is there any idea like when we can get the interaction studio will get started? Uh, yes, IS will be starting uh, end of the April, uh, Indraja. So yeah, because uh, we would love to complete all the basic stuff and then we can start yes. to IS. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, I think Akash back. So yeah, uh, uh, we can the screen, Akash. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry, everyone, about that. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time and joining in. Uh, so today is the session nine of the Marketing Cloud Bootcamp. And uh, shout out to Singapore Marketers Group for organizing the bootcamp. I hope everyone is able to learn something through these sessions. Uh, a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm Akash Israni. I'm a marketing cloud developer and consultant. Uh, I'm the author of sfmcstack.com. And I also do post actively on my LinkedIn page called uh, SFMC Stack. So uh, please check that out. Um, I'm also a, a 7x Salesforce uh, certified. And uh, these are my social handles. Uh, please feel free to reach out uh, if you have any questions or anything in general related to uh, marketing cloud. Uh, yeah, uh, so for today's agenda, uh, we have two topics. Uh, first is data upload, where uh, we will be focusing on uh, how to send ETL data feeds from marketing cloud to personalization. So uh, for personalization, I won't deep dive much into that because that will be covered in the upcoming sessions in detail. Uh, so just to give you some context about what personalization is. So it's a real-time engine that collects users activities uh, across different channels. And then it provides uh, personalized experiences to all the users. Say for example, uh, if I'm a customer and I'm uh, browsing through the website, 
So depending on the actions that I take on the website, personalization will uh, give me some product suggestions or offers uh, in real time. So uh, you will see a lot more capabilities uh, about the personalization uh, in the next sessions. Uh, so uh, it basically provides uh, personalized experiences and content to each of the users. Uh, so coming to the subtopics uh, that I'll be covering today, uh, first is key terms uh, that is uh, relevant to this session, then ETL file requirements, ETL data feed process, ETL data feed flow, and then uh, I'll be covering a demo along with a few examples. Then second topic will be on data retention policies in marketing cloud, uh, which will be a short topic. So uh, first, starting with the first uh, subtopic, which are the key terms. So first, uh, what exactly is ETL? So it's a type of data integration uh, that can be used to blend data from multiple sources. So ETL usually has a uh, three step, uh, which is first is extract, uh, which is the process of gathering all the data from uh, source systems. Next is transform, uh, which is the process of converting the data into a required format. So usually in this phase, we perform operations like uh, filtering and deduplicating the data, uh, converting the data into a required format that uh, can be uh, processed by the target system and uh, performing all the necessary joins uh, required as per the schema. Uh, third is uh, load, which is the process of loading the data into destination or a target system. So in the screenshot that you see, uh, we take the data from source system uh, transform it that is into a required format and then load the data into the target system. So that's what uh, ETL is. Yeah, next we have a feed. So feed is a way to send structured data from one system to another. Uh, feeds are basically a pathway for sending files. So one example of feed would be a RSS feed. Say for example, if uh, I have a RSS feed for my blog, and if someone wants to display that blog in their website, they can subscribe to my RSS feed. And as and when I uh, create new content or uh, update any content within my blog, uh, they will be able to see that in their system as well. So uh, feeds are just a way to send structured information from one system to another. Uh, next is a uh, files. A uh, file is the data that you uh, send during the ETL process. Then we have a SFTP, which is a secure file transfer protocol. Uh, so it's a protocol that is used to transfer files securely over the web using uh, encryption and authentication methods. So I'll uh, cover more about this in the demo. Uh, next we have ETL data feeds or ETL feeds. So in personalization, uh, if we want to uh, use ETL integration, in that case, we use uh, ETL data feeds. So what it essentially does is it pulls the uh, file generated by an external source, and then it will import that data into personalization. So towards the right that you see, we have uh, all the available feeds in personalization. So depending on what type of data you want to import into personalization, you will be using those specific ETL feeds. Say for example, if I want to import account information, in that case, I'll be using account ETL. And if I need any uh, user information in that case, I'll be uh, using user ETL. So for today's session, uh, I'll be focusing on how you can get the data for uh, user uh, profiles using the user ETL. Next, we have a multiple identity system. So uh, identity system in personalization is uh, basically used to configure unique identifiers that you uh, used to recognize a known individual. So think of it like uh, using a subscriber key in marketing cloud uh, that you use to identify a subscriber within uh, email studio. So it comes with uh, several out of the box identity types. So in the screenshot that you see, uh, we have six uh, default identity types, which are the unique identifiers that you use in personalization. So you can either use one of them or more than one, depending on the requirement. So now why do we even need this identity system in personalization? So the reason is when your users engage across different channels, uh, you might end up having a lot of user profiles, right? Now, uh, in order to get a unified view 
of each individual user we need something that can identify that uh, individual and map those records so for that reason uh, we use this identity system so um, by default you have the six identifiers configured next is identity attributes so uh, whenever you create an attribute in personalization and tie them to an identity type uh, which i showed in the earlier slide so that becomes a identity attribute so by default uh, in personalization you get uh, four identity attributes uh, if needed you can add more attributes up to 100 attributes so each uh, identity attribute that you create uh, it will be a uh, string type so you cannot use any other data type uh, while creating identity attributes so uh, if you notice over here we i uh, using a customer id attribute uh, that is mapped to an identity type called customer id so if i have to use uh, identity identifiers i need to create an attribute and then map them to an identity type so uh, just to sum it up identity type is the uh, unique identifiers and identity attributes are the one that you will be using in your uh, files uh, and finally we have a data set so data sets are uh, how you manage access and information across uh, personalization so think of it like a business unit in marketing cloud so uh, we create different business units uh, to manage all the access and information right similarly uh, we create data sets in personalization so uh, within your account you can create multiple data sets uh, the hard limit is uh, 20 data sets that you can create uh, you can delete those data sets as well uh, if you don't need them but doing so will delete all the data within that data set uh, so that's about the key terms uh, second topic is on uh, etl file requirements so first we have uh, the file naming and extensions uh, so all the files uh, that we use uh, that must be a csv file format and uh, all the character encoding must be in uh, utf8 uh, which i'll be again uh, showcasing in the demo uh, the files it can be compressed and encrypted uh, similar to how you uh, do it in marketing cloud so uh, valid compression formats are .zip and .gz and uh, the valid encryption extension is .pgp so uh, all the files that uh, you uh, give it a name uh, and the formats so it has to follow a specific schema say uh, so all the available etl feeds that i uh, showed earlier each of them have a specific schema that you have to follow and you cannot modify that schema uh, you always have to follow that schema be it for your file name for your extensions or even your header names within the file so uh, for the file name uh, each etl data feed has a specific format which is a etl data feed name followed by a date and time so say for example if i am using user etl in that case it will be user followed by date and followed by time dot csv so if i want to use account etl in that case it would be account followed by date and time so depending on the etl that you are using you have to use those uh, specific file naming format and it would uh, always be dot csv uh, one important point to note is uh, when you upload multiple files in the personalization sftp uh, in that case it will process each of those files uh, depending on the date or the time stamp uh, that the file was uploaded uh, next part is uh, header structure so this is basically uh, the header names that you use within the files uh, so the first header name that should you, you should have within the file is either an id or an identity attribute so id is uh, the id of the etl feed that you are uploading and uh, there might be some instances where this must be uh, this might be slightly different for example uh, user etl data feed you might be using user id instead of just id Uh, if i am using account etl feed in that case it would be account id so depending on uh, each feeds you use those specific ids uh, some important points to note id values are case sensitive so if i am using capital i over here in the header name 
it would uh, not process that file and uh, it must not have any white space uh, in between. And all the IDs or identity attributes that you use, uh, they should be of four character minimum, uh, all the values. And uh, these two final two points are very important. So uh, when you're not using the multiple identity system, which is the unique identifiers, in that case, you have to add a user ID within the file, okay? Uh, and when you are using the multiple identity system, uh, user ID need not be added. In that case, you have to use identity attribute. So uh, if you are not using ident identity system, you add a user ID. And if you are, uh, then instead of user ID, you will be using identity attribute. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, one identity attribute is required. If you want more than one identifiers within the file, you can add that as well. So that personalization will use those identifiers to uh, match those records. And uh, next header structure that we have is uh, attribute colon attribute name. So this is the format that you use for uh, system custom attributes. So let's say for example, uh, if I want to create a custom attribute called country, in that case, uh, my header name within the file would be attribute colon country, okay? Then uh, you have system fields within personalization for each ETL data field. So uh, depending on what uh, ETL feed you're using, these system fields can vary. Uh, in user ETL data feed, you just have two system fields. One is the name and one is the account ID. So um, one important note is like, it's not recommended that you create a custom attribute uh, with the same name as the system attribute. Say for example, uh, if I'm creating a name uh, attribute uh, as a custom attribute, uh, since I already have that as a system uh, attribute, it will cause data issues. So all the system fields that you have for each ETL data feed, you can see that in the documentation and depending on uh, your use case, either you can use those system fields or create your own custom attributes within personalization, okay? Uh, so just to sum it up uh, about the header structure. So when you are using ID, the format would be either ID, user ID or account ID, depending on the ETL feed that you use. For identity attributes, uh, which are your unique identifiers, system attributes, uh, which are system defined attributes and custom attributes that you'll be creating uh, manually. So for all three, the format would be attribute colon followed by the attribute name. So this is the header name uh, that you need to follow within your file. If you uh, even uh, misinterpret any of the columns uh, within the file, uh, ETL will not process that file. It will just throw an error. So uh, just to give you some examples of how the file looks like. So in the first file structure, uh, this is when you're not using the identity system, okay? Now in that case, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you have to use user ID. So first column would be a user ID followed by uh, system fields and your custom fields. Now uh, over here, you see email address. So this is a custom attribute, not a, a identity attribute, okay? Because uh, when you're using not using multiple identity system, you have to use user ID and not the identity attributes, okay? So either it's the ID or either it's the identity attribute, okay? Uh, in here below, you see that uh, how marketing cloud and personalization um, attributes will map. So uh, towards the left that you see, this is how you will be creating the fields within your data extension, okay? And towards the right that you see, uh, this is how the attributes will be configured in your personalization. Now, our next example we have is uh, when you're using the identity system. So if you notice this file does not have the user ID, right? So uh, in that case, we are using identity attributes. Uh, so in this file, we are using two identity attributes. Uh, one is the email address and one is the customer ID, okay? And uh, rest of the two fields that you see are the system fields. And uh, similarly, uh, you will uh, do the mapping for those attributes in marketing cloud and personalization, okay? 
Uh, and finally, we have frequency. So frequency is uh, the personalization system uh, has a built-in listener for the files that you upload in the SFTP. So every 50 minutes, uh, what it does is it goes to the inbound folder of your SFTP. It checks if there's any file uh, with the specific schema or the file name extension that you have defined. So if there is a file with, uh, if there is a match, it will pull the file and then import the data into personalization. So if you uh, do some mistake in the file naming, uh, ETL data feed will not process that file. Uh, so be mindful of that. Um, and the general recommendation is uh, that you process the files every day. But if you uh, want, uh, depending on your use case, you can consider uploading the files uh, every one hour. Uh, next subtopic we have is uh, ETL data feed process. Uh, so first step, uh, what you do is you start with what data do you want to get from the external system into personalization. Okay. Uh, step two is uh, one, uh, you extract the data from the system and you create a file depending on the schema of the ETL feed that you will be using, okay? like the file naming and the header names within the file. Step three is uh, when the file is ready, you create an automation so that uh, it uploads that file into the inbound folder of your uh, personalization SFTP. Uh, step four is uh, activating the ETL feed. So if you want to process that file uh, within personalization, you have to activate those ETL feeds, okay? If you don't activate it, it will uh, remain in the inbound folder and uh, your data would not be imported into personalization, okay? I'll uh, cover this in the demo again. Uh, so step five is your processing job. Uh, it runs automatically. Uh, so depending on your schedule, if you're setting it to either every day or every one hour, and uh, it will move the files from uh, different folders. Okay. So uh, this is the basic uh, process uh, of how you would uh, set up the ETL data feeds. Uh, so the fourth subtopic that we have is the flow. Over here, uh, you can see that in Marketing Cloud, uh, we will use Automation Studio for all our ETL activities and processing. So once the file is ready, we will uh, move that file to personalization SFTP. And then using the user ETL data feed that you see over here, once it's activated, it will move the file from SFTP to the user uh, items okay, or user profiles. So uh, this is what I'll be uh, showing in the demo today. Uh, okay, so time for a demo. Let me go to marketing uh, cloud. So uh, first I'll uh, cover uh, some basics within personalization. Uh, so for to ac uh, access personalization, uh, you go to uh, personalization and click on this. So once you do that, uh, this is how your UI would look like. Uh, so if I want to create a data set, uh, I'll uh, just click on this over here and say manage data sets. Okay. Now uh, I'll just uh, create a data set for a demo. Uh, so I'll just name it as SFMC demo. Uh, now here you see this ID and name, right? So once you uh, set that up, you cannot modify it again. So be careful uh, while naming this data set, okay? Uh, you can always go ahead and delete that. But uh, once you delete that data set, all the data and uh, every other configuration within that data set would be deleted. Uh, so after that, you have uh, something called data set type. So if you want to use that data set type for production QA, uh, depending on your use case, you can select that. Uh, if you don't want to do that now, you can do that later as well from the setup. And finally, you have the option of tracking accounts. So you use this option when you have, uh, when you want to track uh, accounts for the uh, B2B sites, uh, not the B2C sites. So these two options, uh, you can always enable that later in the setup. So for now, I'll just leave these two as blank and I'll uh, go ahead and create the data set.
So if you uh, sometimes you might not uh, see the data set over here in that case, uh, just go ahead and refresh it. Okay, uh, so here you see uh, the SFMC demo. This is the data set that we just created. So uh, once I create that data set, uh, this is how the screen would look like. So uh, first I'll just uh, talk through uh, the identity types. So if you go to settings, identity types, uh, this is, uh, these are the identity types that uh, you will be seeing. So if I want, I can also uh, create any new identity type, okay? Uh, so depending on your use case, what identifiers you want to use, you can uh, create uh, new identity types uh, and uh, you can only create uh, three additional identity types. So in total, you uh, will create only nine identity types. Uh, so either you can use one of them or all of them. I'll be uh, showcasing that next. So uh, for identity types, so uh, let's say if I want to uh, use any uh, lead ID or something, Okay, uh, in that case, uh, sorry. so I'll just give it a label, uh, say lead ID. Next, uh, you define the uniqueness. So here you have two options. So first option that you see identity namespace. So if you select this, uh, what happens is that value that you set for this uh, at uh, your identity type, it will be unique for only one individual you cannot use that same value for other individuals, okay? And this will be the identifier that you will be using to uh, look up the records in personalization and then match those records. Uh, when you use not unique, so in that case, uh, it means the values can belong to multiple users, not just to one single user. So that's when you use not unique. But in this case, if I select not unique, uh, it cannot, uh, go ahead and look up the records and match it, okay? Because it's not a unique identifier. It uh, won't match the records, even if there is a, a matching uh, value for it, okay? So unique, not unique. So those are the two options that you have. Uh, but since we are using ETL, so ETL cannot update uh, values that is tied to this identity type, okay? So uh, if I am sending an ETL uh, file, uh, if that ETL file has a header name that is mapped to this uh, lead ID, it cannot update it. It will just uh, throw an error because ETL files uh, just cannot uh, update the values for it. Okay. So just uh, when you are, you are doing ETL uh, operations, uh, make sure that you are only using uh, unique identifiers. So you can use any of the identifiers uh, from these. If that doesn't uh, suffice your requirement, you can go ahead and create additional identity types, okay? So, and last you have case sensitive. If those values that you're getting into personalization, are those uh, case sensitive or not? You have to um, select as appropriate. So these are, uh, this is as per the uh, identity types. Now, uh, one thing you'll notice over here is towards the right, uh, I cannot edit or delete this identity type once I have created it, okay? So once I create any identity type, it's not just uh, that it will apply to that specific data set. So if I uh, create a new record over here, right, it will show that identity type in all the data sets that I currently have, not just to this data set. So be careful uh, while uh, specifying the identity types. And uh, as a best practice, always, Whenever you are getting the, before getting the data into personalization, you uh, check with your team what identifiers that you'll be using across various channels, and then go ahead and uh, bring that data to uh, personalization, okay? So uh, next part is attributes. So by default, uh, user attributes, you will uh, see these four, which are uh, tied to an identity type. So when you're creating an attribute, that means that I can use this as an identifier in my file, okay? So identity types is where you create those uh, uniqueness and attributes is where you will be uh, using that uh, saying to personalization that, okay, this is the 
attribute that I'll be receiving from the ETL file. And I have to just go and uh, create that record. Okay. Now uh, you can create new attributes as well if needed. Uh, you can create up to 100 uh, attributes in the user profile. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, if I want to just create, let's say, uh, a custom attribute called country. So I'll just do that, give it a name. And uh, I can select the data type. So if you uh, remember, I mentioned that for identity attributes, you can just use string data type. But for other uh, custom attributes, you can do it depending on your use case. So you have string, integer, decimal, and various data types. Uh, next, you have a classification uh, where is uh, where you specify whether the field that you are creating, if it is uh, sensitive. Uh, so if I select sensitive, that means uh, this value that you will be uh, getting into this field, it will be encrypted format. Only the appropriate users uh, who have a specific permissions will be able to see that actual value, but rest of the users will see that in an encrypted format. Then next you have personally identifiable. So uh, if you are creating an attribute, which is uh, some personal identifiable, say for example, like your uh, social security numbers, uh, in that case, you can use a personal identifiable. Uh, this value, uh, when you select this, use all the users can see that value. Uh, it's not hidden for any of them. And finally, you have non-sensitive data. So uh, if you have any field uh, where the data is not sensitive enough, uh, you can go ahead with this option, okay? And finally, uh, this is where you map the identity type, okay? Now, if I, uh, let's say if I, if I have the attribute called uh, contact ID, CRM contact ID, and in that case, I can just go ahead and select this over here, okay? So this will become the unique identifier. But what if I just want to create a custom attribute and not map it to uh, identity type? In that case, you just select this blank value over here and click on save, okay? So uh, once you uh, save that, you that will become a custom attribute, okay? Uh, and next we have uh, feeds. So I'll just uh, first uh, walk you through feeds dashboard. So uh, here you see that these are the, uh, towards the left, you have different ETL feeds that are available. Uh, so I'll go to uh, user ETL. So here, uh, currently this feed uh, is not activated. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, come back to this uh, when we are uh, walking through the file uh, processing. Uh, but for now, uh, uh, depending on what ETL you want to use, you have to activate those ETLs. So uh, what it essentially does is it will just take the file from your SFTP depending on the schema, if it matches that schema, and then it will import that data into personalization, okay? Then next we have uh, SFTP files. So this is where uh, we will be placing the file from marketing cloud. Now uh, within this, you will see that there are six different folders. So uh, in the failed folder, if any files error out, uh, you will see them in this folder. And inbound folder is where you get the data from external system to personalization SFTP. Outbound is where uh, you send the data from personalization to an external system and next you have process so uh, this is where uh, the process all the process files uh, will be okay and uh, next is processing uh, say i have a very uh, large file now in order to process that file it uh, takes some time in that case i'll be able to notice that file in this folder in the processing folder if it's a very uh, short file with uh, some 2 to 10 records uh, it will you won't be able to notice that because it moves uh, from inbound folder to processing to process uh, within that uh, short period of time. Uh, finally, we have uh, testing. So if I am testing any files, uh, in that case, all the files uh, that I test, it will be visible in this folder. Okay. So uh, 
that uh, i think those basics uh, would be sufficient you know so uh, now let's get started with how you actually uh, send the etl feeds from marketing cloud to personalization okay so for that uh, first step is that we want to connect personalization sftp to marketing cloud so for that what we have to do is over here uh, go to security uh, click on manage sftp configuration so i'll go ahead and create a new sftp user so let's say uh, i'll create a sfmc demo now uh, i have to choose which uh, data set do i want to map this sftp uh, to okay this is very important i'll explain you why uh, later uh, so for now since i have created this sfmc demo data set i'll just go ahead and select it and i'll click on create now uh, once you create that uh, you have to uh, download that csv file okay so uh, once i have that csv in my system i can just go ahead and close this now let's uh, go to marketing cloud and see how we can actually connect this. So I'll uh, go back to marketing cloud, uh, go to username, setup. Over here, uh, we uh, go to data management and go to file locations. Now I'll uh, go ahead and create a new file lo uh, location for that SFTP. So I'll just uh, give it a name as personalization SFTP. Okay. Uh, here in the location information uh, under here, you can just, uh, you have various options. So for now, since we want to connect an SFTP site, I'll uh, go ahead and select this option that says uh, external SFTP. So uh, here, if you notice, uh, we have URL, username, password. So this I can get from the file that I just downloaded from the personalization. So I'll just go ahead and open this. So here, uh, first I'll just copy this login URL and uh, paste it over here. Next, we need the username and password that I'll again uh, copy from this file. Okay. Um, so once I have uh, the username, password, okay. So all the three columns that you see over here, I've just added it to uh, setup. Now, uh, if you uh, remember by creating the SFTP in personalization, we um, specified what data set do we need that FTP for, right? So in uh, the, this is where you will be modifying this URL. Okay, just give me one second. Yeah. Okay. Uh so this part that you see over here, uh, it says URL slash dataset slash the inbound folder. So this will be the URL that you get from the file. This is the dataset name. So the personalization, you see this SFMC demo, right? So that is the dataset name. And the inbound folder is where you will be placing the file, okay? So this is how the URL format should be. So uh, once I have all that details, 
I'll just uh, go ahead and click on save. Okay, so I have that SFTP over here. Uh, that is step number one. For step number two, we just have to uh, create a data extension for which I'll uh, navigate to email studio. Go to uh, data extensions. So here uh, I have uh, created two data extensions. So first is the contact data. Uh, that is uh, the data that I will be uh, having in Marketing Cloud. And second is user ETL data extension, which is the data extension that we'll be using to uh, create our uh, uh, file. Okay. So I'll just quickly go into this data extension. So uh, first walking you through uh, contact data. So in this, uh, we have three fields. Uh, one is subscriber key, name and email address. So I just have two uh, simple records over here. Uh, so we have two records, uh, one is for Emily and one is for Jack, okay? So next step, uh, yeah. So user ETL data extension. So here, if you notice, uh, we are using that format that we require uh, for the header names within the file. So the first uh, field that we have is attribute colon SFMC contact key. This is attribute colon name and the attribute colon email address. So uh, make sure that you are uh, using the correct uh, names uh, that you have all uh, in personalization, okay? Because that is what it will be using for uh, mapping those fields. So this is a empty data extension for now. Uh, so step number three is uh, we load the data into the target data extension, which is our user ETL DB. Okay. So for that, uh, I'll go to automation studio. I'll uh, create a new automation. So this is where uh, we'll be performing all our ETL activities. Uh, so the first step is that we need to uh, extract that data from the contact data data extension. And then uh, as needed, we can format it and then uh, load it into our target D. Okay, so I'll, I'll choose this SQL query. So uh, first step is uh, selecting the query. So I'll uh, walk you through this query first. So here uh, you see that I'm saying select uh, all the three fields that I have from in the contact data data extension. Okay and uh, add an alias that will uh, match the target data extension uh, fields, which is our user ETL, okay? So this is the data extension uh, where we'll have the data and uh, we are just overriding it every time this automation runs. Uh, then we have name and email address as well, okay? Now I have just taken a simple query for this demo. Uh, there might be a few instances where uh, you might need to format dates into, uh, into specific formats or uh, even use some case statements to get the required value. So you can uh, do the formatting as needed. Uh, but for this demo, I have just taken a simple query. Uh, so this is our uh, step one of the automation where we load the data into target data extension, okay? So uh, I'll uh, now once our step one is ready, we'll go to step two, which is you extract that data from uh, the target data extension. So for that, we need the target uh, extra data extract. So click on choose, I'll uh, go ahead and create new. So I'll just say uh, user ETL data extension extract. So now here we have to define a file naming pattern that we will be using. Now, uh, if you remember, I mentioned that there's a specific file name pattern that you have to use for the ETL feeds. So uh, let me show you that uh, quickly. Okay. So this is the file naming pattern that we need uh, for our ETL files. So uh, as you know already that a marketing cloud has, a, uh, has some wildcard specifiers that you can use, okay. For the year, month, day, hour, minutes and seconds as well. So uh, this is the pattern that I'll be using for now, okay? So that I can get the current year, month, day, and hour. 
Uh, now here, if you notice, uh, although we have wildcards for minutes and seconds, I'm not using that. The reason being, uh, if I use this file name pattern in step two now, by the time it uh, reaches step three, okay, step three won't be able to find that file because by the time a few seconds or a few minutes might have passed, right? So that's the reason why I'm just using a zero zero over here instead of using this, okay? So instead of using minutes and seconds, I'm just using zero and zero because uh, for data extract, it usually takes the data from the target D and it places that in the safe house, which is the temporary location that is uh, in the that marketing cloud has. So uh, in order to read that file correctly, we should not be using minutes and seconds, okay? The automation will just error out if you uh, use this part, okay? So for now, uh, this is the file name pattern that we would need. So I'll just copy this and go back to Automation Studio. So here under file name pattern, I'll just paste that, okay? With the minute and seconds being zero and zero. Okay. Now, uh, for the extract type that we need, we have a data extension extract, okay? So I'll just select that and then click on next. Now here, uh, we need the external key of the data extension that we want to extract. So for that, I'll uh, go back to email studio. Now, uh, this is the data extension, right? So here you will notice that there's a external key for that. So this is what we need. So I'll just copy yeah. this. I'll uh, paste that over here. Now uh, I'll select this checkbox saying that uh, this has uh, header names and uh, I'll also select text qualified. So what this does is, uh, so whatever the text that you have, it will uh, enclose that text within double quotes, okay? So since personalization accepts that format, uh, we have to select this checkbox, okay? Uh, so this is the setup for this and a column del delimiter would, we'll just keep it as comma. So I'll click on next. And uh, once everything is done, you just click on finish. So this is step two. Uh, step three, uh, now once we have that file, we need to convert that into UTF-8 format, right? So for that, again, we just drag and drop uh, data extract, okay? So I'll create a new data extract. Now here, you have to specify the file name format. So I'll just uh, go back to my file. I'll just copy this and I'll paste it over here. Okay. So it's the same name uh, pattern that we use for step two of the automation. Now uh, here under extract tag, uh, where you have uh, this option called file convert. Okay. Now this option might not be enabled in your marketing cloud account. If that is the case, uh, reach out to support. Uh, they'll enable it for you. So this is what we'll be using to convert our file to UTF-8, okay? So define the file name, or the extract type should be file convert. Now here uh, it says convert to option. So you have these options, but uh, we just need a UTF-8. So I'll just select that. Now uh, here, if you see, it says is the file in safe house. So you have to enable this checkbox because after the step two run is completed, that file will be uh, kept in your safe house. So this uh, step will read that file from uh, the safe house, okay? So in order to do that, I'm just enabling this checkbox and uh, I'll not specify anything over here because since the file is in the safe house, not in any uh, FTP folders, okay? So uh, this is for uh, step three. Now, uh, once we have that, file format, we have converted it to UTF-8. The final step that we need is to transfer that file to our personalization SFTP, okay? So for that, we use activity called uh, file transfer. So uh, I'll just click on choose. I'll say ETL file uh, transfer. Now here you have two options. Uh, one is manage file and new file from safe house. Uh, since we already have that file uh, within our safe house, I'll just click on this. 
and click on next here again you have to specify the same pattern that we used earlier so i'll just uh, copy this and paste it over here now here uh, destination uh, that we created earlier so uh, since the name that i gave was personalization sftp so i'll just select that so that uh, it knows where to place that file if needed uh, you can you encrypt that file okay but for now uh, i'll just uh, uh, leave that as is and i'll move to next step so uh, this is a uh, uh, file name pattern and destination and uh, moving a file from safers okay so I'll just click on finish and uh, in order to run this i'll just uh, take this schedule and add it i'll give it a name called uh, OTI feed so uh, just to uh, sum it up so first step is we load the data into target data extension second is you extract that data and place it in a safe house third step is converting that data into a CS, uh, utf8 format and fourth step is where you transfer that file to your personalization sftp okay now uh, i'll just save this and click on done once So I'll run all the activities. Okay, uh, now this automation has uh, started. Um, so while this runs, I'll, uh, meanwhile, I'll just go back to SFTP. So uh, once that automation run is completed, uh, we should be able to see the file in the inbound folder. Okay, uh, now if you uh, remember that we haven't activated the user ETL yet. So unless I uh, go and activate that, the file would remain in inbound folder. Once I activate the ETL feed, it will take the file, uh, move the file from inbound to processing to process state. So uh, finally, when once the processing is done, you will be able to see the file only over here, not in inbound folder. So uh, that's how this SFTP works. So uh, I'll just go to feed dashboard. So let's see if that automation is completed. Okay, uh, and uh, one more thing is like, uh, once you get all the files from the ETL jobs, so all that uh, data, you will be able to monitor it over here. So it will uh, show you uh, what was the start time for that job, how many rows were processed, how many were successfully uh, extracted and committed. So committed uh, counters where you successfully know that this data has uh, been uploaded uh, to personalization. Okay, so I'll uh, show this option in a minute. Uh, let's see if this runs.
Agach, is this your running first time or? Yeah, actually, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, it was taking some time. Yes. Um, yeah, so once this automation run is completed, uh, we sh uh, let's see if there's a file in the inbound folder. So just refresh it. And uh, here, if you notice, uh, we have that file format, right? So user followed by date and time. So for minutes and seconds, if you notice, since we kept it zero, zero, we don't uh, see that updated over here. So now uh, once uh, this file is an inbound folder, uh, I'll just go ahead and activate the ETL data feed. So I'll go to user ETL, I'll uh, say activate. Now it will ask me that, uh, so once you activate this, it will automatically process the files uh, as and when it receives in the SFTP, okay? So I'll just say yes. Now uh, this is activated. So I'll go back to SFTP. I'll say refresh. So uh, sometimes it uh, takes a few minutes uh, to process. Okay, uh, while that is uh, running, uh, what we can do is uh, I can show you how do you uh, upload the file manually. So uh, if I have to do one-time upload uh, for the specific ETL data feed, in that case, I can do that manually as well. So for that, again, uh, we just use this uh, specific ETL that we need. And uh, we can, here you see the option of validate or execute. So if I uh, click on that, it will uh, give me two options. So select file is when you, you have that file in uh, SFTP and upload file is when you want to upload that file from your uh, system, okay? So uh, let's do that. Uh, let me check if this is completed, okay. Yeah, so I'll just go ahead and upload a file. So in my desktop, I have a file with uh, three fields. So I can just select that file so it will show me what the file uh, contents are. So uh, we have three fields. Now, uh, if you notice, we are not using user ID over here because uh, I'm using a identity system. So in order to test this, you just click on run test over here. Now, uh, once this run is completed, it will uh, show you the number of records uh, that were uh, successful run and uh, error route. Now, uh, one difference, uh, major difference between uh, getting the file through automation versus doing it manually is, uh, if you are getting it through automation, that data will be committed automatically to personalization, okay? There's no option that you need to enable it. It does that automatically. But when I have to uh, do it manual upload, the data won't get committed unless I click this option over here that you see, okay? So once I click on commit, it will ask me uh, whether you want to commit this data to uh, the, the specific data set. So if I say yes, it will uh, go ahead and commit that data. Now, uh, once that data is committed, uh, we can go back to personalization. Under audiences, uh, you will see that go to user segments and here you have the option of all user. So if you select that, uh, here you see uh, I have two files, okay? So this is the files that I received uh, through our uh, manual upload. So if I want to check more details about this file, you just click on that user and click on more details. So here, if you see uh, it has the user ID, uh, username, email address. So if I go back to marketing cloud, um, so here. Okay, uh, so these are the two records that we uploaded through automation and uh, the rest of the two records that we currently see, those were manually uploaded. Now, uh, let me go back to the SFTP to check if that automation, um, the process, file processing has been completed. So let me refresh that, okay. Uh, 
Sometimes it takes up to 10 to 15 minutes uh, for that file to process. But uh, since it's still in inbound folder, that means that data has not been committed to the personalization yet. So, uh, but once that uh, process that file, you should be uh, seeing that folder over here, okay? So this is uh, where you will see all the user uh, profile data. So depending on uh, if users are visiting your websites or interacting with your mobile application, so whatever the interactions happen, you will see that for each specific user. So uh, here also you get uh, the activities that they are browsing within the website. Okay. Um, so I'll just uh, go back to this. So I'll uh, again come back to this uh, automation run. Um, I'll for now let's just go back to slides where I can show you some of the examples quickly. So. So this is uh, example one of the identity configuration. So let's say if I have uh, configured the identifier as email address and this was the right that you see, uh, let's say that user profile already exists in personalization. Now uh, email address is uh, john.do over here, it's the same. So that means there will be a match. So uh, it will merge all the re rest of the attributes uh, to this user profile, okay? Since there is a match for that identifier, it will go ahead and merge that. For the example two, uh, we are using two identifiers. One is email address and one is contact key. Now towards the right, you notice that uh, we have a user profile, but it has a different email address, right? Here we have John, here we have Jane. So in this case, uh, what personalization does is it will move on to the next identifier and see if there's any identifier with this value. Now. Since we have that value match for the contact key, it will merge those records, okay? So it's not that all the identifiers have to match, even if one identifier matches with the existing data, it will go ahead and merge all that uh, data into a single user profile, okay? Now, in the next example, you see that here we are taking email address as a unique identifier, but the phone number, we are not taking that as a, a unique identifier, okay? In this case, uh, email address here is Jane, here is John, right? So it will not match it, okay? Although you might notice that the phone number over here matches, but it's not a unique identifier. So instead of uh, going and uh, merging that profile with this, it will create a new record because it will consider that as a new user profile since there is no match, okay? Although the phone numbers match, but the unique identifier does not match. So it will just go ahead and create a new record for it. Okay. So it will end up creating, uh, this will be one existing user profile and this will be a new user profile that will be coming into personalization. Okay. Now uh, here's a uh, one more example where uh, here in the middle that you see, these are two existing user profiles and towards the left is what uh, we are uploading the data. So here we have email address and customer ID both has the unique identifier, okay? Now in this case, it will check this uh, value, it matches, it checks the customer ID, it matches in a different user profile, okay? Now what it will do is it will merge those two user profiles into a single user profile, okay? So uh, at the end, you will have just one user profile instead of two user profiles that you had earlier with the values as uh, what you see it was the right, okay? So the first two values are from this user profile and the last value is from this user profile. Okay. Now, uh, in the last example, uh, what happens if you already have values for everything, right? All the attributes. Now, let's say there are two user profiles that has a uh, different contact key and customer ID. Here you have different contact key and customer ID. So if I'm uploading a data with this uh, value, so this, uh, the ending with HJL, so it matches with this profile, right? And the customer ID that you see 2323, it does not match with this, but it matches with this user profile. So in this case, what it does is it will merge both those records into a single uh, user profile, and it will end up creating the values that it received with the latest timestamp, right? So these are existing profiles, but, uh, the record that I'm uploading is the latest timestamp. So whatever the record that you upload with the latest timestamp, those values, it will go and update it, okay? 
So that's the reason why you uh, see the these values that I had uploaded it, not the existing values that personalization user profiles already had, right? So um, this is about identity configuration. Now uh, file structures. So first file uh, structure, if you notice, we have user ID and we also have a unique identity attribute called email address. Now, if you uh, remember, I uh, mentioned that if there is a, if you are not using multiple identity system, uh, sorry, if you are using multiple identity system in that case, uh, you need to add identity attribute. User ID need not be referenced, but what happens if you reference both unique ID as well as user ID? So in this case, it will completely ignore this column, okay? And it will create two new records with these two columns, okay? So when I upload this file, it will take these two columns, create two user profiles. It will completely ignore whatever the user ID that you are adding it to the file, okay? So instead of this user ID, it will uh, create its own system generated ID, okay? So I'll uh, come back to that. Uh, so second file structure is a file with a field called SF uh, CRM contact ID that is not defined as an attribute, okay? So let's say if this attribute that I'm using in the file is not configured in personalization. In that case, it will just throw an error. So it will uh, fail the entire file and it will uh, not process any data, okay? Next is uh, what happens when you have two similar IDs within the file, right? So towards the left that you see, uh, it's without using multiple identity system. So for Dwight and Jim, we have two same similar IDs. So in this case, what happens is it will just take the latest uh, second record and it will just completely ignore the first record, okay? So the end result would be uh, Jim and Pam will be added to, uh, added a, created a user, user profile, uh, but Dwight, it will not, okay? So if you have multiple user IDs, it will just use uh, one of them, not, it won't create two separate uh, user profiles for it, okay? Now, towards the right that you see, we have a um, SFMC contact key, right? Again, for Dwight and Jim, we have the same IDs, but uh, in this case as well, the resulting uh, user profile will be Jim and Pam, okay? Dwight, uh, we won't get that user profile in personalization, okay? Uh, next is what happens when the file has blank values, okay? Now, if you're creating this for the very first time, these two records with this contact key, uh, it will go ahead and create uh, these two records with Dwight ha having blank email address and Pam uh, without any username, okay? But what if the record already exists, uh, let's say for Dwight, okay? So uh, if there is a user profile for Dwight, which has an email address, okay? And then I go ahead and upload this file. In that case, it won't override that value the value will still remain, okay? So the blank uh, value that I'm trying to add, it won't override that uh, existing value, okay? Unless I have some other email address for Dwight, it won't uh, override it, okay? Uh, so in the final example, we have uh, what happens when you have a file with contact key as well as email address, both identify identity attributes with a blank value, okay? Now for Angela, uh, we don't have any values, right? So what happens is it will uh, throw an error saying that uh, you don't have any uh, identifier for uh, this record. So it uh, won't let you add that data, okay? So uh, some things to note uh, about uh, this ETL data feed process. So you can't manually move files from a personalization SFTP, okay? So if I have a file in inbound folder, I just can't go manually and move those folders around, okay? Then uh, personalization retains the files for 60 days and then it automatically uh, removes those files. So this is just to ensure that uh, we are compliant with all the regulations and it also reduces the risk. The maximum number of attributes that you can add for user uh, per data set is 100, okay? Uh, next you have, you cannot update the archived identity attribute. So uh, what this means is uh, if I go back to personalization, 
and I'll just uh, go to attributes. So here, uh, if you see, uh, let's say uh, customer ID, right? So if I go ahead and edit it, it will let me change that attribute from uh, to custom as well, okay? So if I do this, it becomes a custom attribute, not an identity attribute, okay? I can do this. It will let me save the, uh, save the field. It will also let me add the data for that field, okay? But uh, the problem is once I turn this into a custom attribute, right? It cannot just go back and uh, map this customer ID again, okay? So that is uh, what this point means, uh, which is you cannot update the archived identity attribute. Okay? And next point is you cannot delete the attribute as well. So if I go back and uh, let's say if I want to delete this uh, attribute, so I just cannot delete that. It will just throw an error saying that it's an identity attribute. I cannot delete that, okay? Uh, so be careful with uh, two things. One is identity types. Uh, so identity types, if you create in one data set, it will be uh, across all the data sets. Attributes, if you create in one data set, it will remain specific to that data set. Uh, you cannot uh, see those changes in other data sets. So if I create any new attribute over here, you won't get that attribute in other data sets. It's just specific to this. Okay. Uh, next is uh, if you change an attribute from identity to custom, you cannot delete that. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, we can change this to custom, but once I do that, uh, it won't let me delete it as well, okay? Usually uh, if I go and create new attribute, like uh, let's say country, it will, if I save this, it will let me delete that attribute because it's a custom attribute. But if there's already an attribute that you have tied it to an identity type, it won't let you delete, be it, um, map to an identity type or be it uh, no mapping at all, okay? So uh, be very uh, careful while defining those identity attributes. And final point is uh, once an identity type is configured, uh, you cannot uh, edit nor delete that identity type, okay? So if I go to this identity types, uh, I cannot edit it, neither I can delete that. So uh, that's about uh, how you can send ETL data feeds. So uh, let me just uh, check it for the final time if there's uh, any change in this uh, inbound folder, yeah. Yeah, so if you notice earlier, we had a file over here, right? That we sent from Marketing Cloud. Right now, uh, since that file has been processed, I can go ahead and check in process folder. So here is that file, okay? So uh, that we had sent from Marketing Cloud. Now, once this file is processed, uh, you can again uh, check this data by going to personalization, uh, go to audience, go to all users. Uh, let me just try refreshing that. Okay, uh, for some reason, I'm not able to see it, but uh, again, once that processing is done, you should be able to see those users over here, okay? And uh, you can also monitor that. So if I just go back to the ETL, um, here, uh, if you see, uh, it says that uh, I whatever the files that I uploaded manually or be it via the automation, uh, it will uh, let you monitor everything over here, okay? So if I need to review anything, uh, let's say for this, it says that committed count is two. So I can also check the details for it. So uh, this is uh, what it will uh, tell you that this was the file that you uploaded with this file name. This was the data that uh, was committed, okay? So you can monitor everything within this uh, ETL uh, dashboard. So uh, 
next uh, we have just a short topic on data retention policies uh, that i'll uh, cover quickly and then i'll uh, take up some questions um, okay. so first what are retention policies uh, so a data retention policy is uh, a key part in the life cycle of a record so what it means is uh, it will tell you how long the records can be show, uh, stored within marketing cloud and uh, once that retention period has been reached uh, it will uh, delete all those records depending on the settings uh, that you specify within that uh, data retention policy so each time uh, you create a new data extension in email studio or contact builder you will be prompted to decide if you uh, would like to set a data retention policy now you can uh, also set the data retention policy for either new data extension as well as the existing data extension as well okay so these are some of the options that you would be seeing uh, after you turn on the retention policy so first we have delete options where it says individual records so if i uh, instead of overwriting the entire uh, data extension um, i can go with this option so it will uh, delete the record uh, depending on the timestamp okay so if i am adding a record to a data extension in the back end uh, it will add a timestamp to that record so whenever it reaches the end of retention period it will know that uh, this timestamp is has reached that period it will go ahead and delete that individual uh, record over there okay so second is all records and data extensions so if you uh, you can select this when you are creating a data extension for uh, testing an email send or something okay for that this option would be suitable uh, next you have all records so if i uh, want to delete all the records uh, on a specific period uh, i can go ahead and do that as well uh, for that we need to enable this uh, all records option okay so you have individual records all records and data extensions and all records okay we just can't go ahead and delete just a data extension so uh, that option you don't have it over here so in the, under the period uh, you have three options again uh, one is where you specify the number of days after which that data extension should be deleted now when you select individual records only this option the first option would be enabled okay but when you select second and third option you will uh, this option will be enabled for you okay so uh, if i have this option enabled uh, reset period on import so you have to uh, choose that along with uh, these two options okay so if i am selecting after six days and i enable this checkbox that says reset period so what happens is uh, let's say uh, you're deleting trying to delete within after six days uh, and if i go ahead and import a, a, another file that has the data on the fifth day so what happens is it will reset that import period to six days again okay so instead of deleting that on the sixth day it will go ahead and delete that on the 11th day okay not on the next day itself okay so uh, if you want such configuration you can uh, select this and then enable this checkbox over here okay now if i just want to keep it simple go ahead and uh, click uh, delete the records on a specific date i can do that as well by enabling this option okay so uh final thing uh quick things to note uh so first is you can uh, apply data retention policy to existing data extension as long as it does not have more than 100 million records okay in contact builder so you cannot do that from email studio so only when you have uh, less than million, 100 million records you can go and enable retention policy from contact builder okay but uh, as a best practice it's recommended that whenever you create that data extension or uh, you can set that data retention policy okay um, second point is uh, by default if you have any data extensions that you are not using uh, so after six months it will by default delete those uh, and it runs every uh, nightly depending on the time zone settings that you have within your account um, next point is uh, so data retention policies you can use that in combination with your uh, sql queries uh, the actions that you define over there which are add update overwrite so you can use this in combination with uh, that con uh, setting so that will make sure that you're not keeping any data within your marketing cloud that you're not that is not useful 
uh, and it will help ensure that it will always be up to date and you can use it for your campaigns whenever you want it and final point is uh, while it's not required it's recommended that you set a data retention policy for the send logs so send log is uh, basically uh, whenever you send an email uh, during that runtime whatever the information that email has you can capture it within the send logs you can also create your own custom attributes within uh, send logs as well so since you're sending a large number of marketing campaigns from your marketing cloud account right this send log can quickly grow and your data might be uh, have a very high volume at some point so in order to uh, avoid any performance issue it's better that you set a retention policy for a send log okay um so that's all i had for this session uh if there are any questions i can uh check that um Uh, Pani, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I think there are some questions, especially. So let me uh, let me ask those questions. Uh, sure. Can you please reopen the two data extract activity elements you have shown uh, for for sending? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, data extract. Yeah. Um, so this is the first data extract activity. Um, wherein we are using data extension extract to extract the information from our target view so this is the external key for that um, and the second data extract uh, it converts the file to a csv format so uh, was there anything specific uh, that you wanted me to explain within that no i think uh, she asked about only those two i did extract activities one with the uh, yeah this is conversion the other one is to load so second step is data extension extract and second uh, the third step is the conversion of the file to utf8 format yep thank you so there's another question akash so where did you specify phone number is not an identifier just as it's not string type data yeah uh, so if i can go to uh, settings attributes so i can just uh, create a custom attribute as well okay so i can say phone number and i can say personal identifier so if i select this as blank that means uh, that becomes a custom attribute so uh, you can uh, if needed you can have uh, multiple uh, phone numbers for same user profile uh, one thing uh, important point over here is uh, if you see the email address over here is uh, mapped to an identity type right that means each user profile that i have within personalization will only have one email one unique email address okay so that same email address cannot belong to multiple user profiles since i'm using that as a unique identifier so depending on the use case uh, that you want to perform you can uh, do that uh, you can also create your own custom attributes as well okay but uh, since uh, i am using uh, i'm getting the data via etl jobs etl jobs they cannot uh, like i'll just go to identity types to show you that um, so here if you see uh, we have a identity type called phone which is has the unique uh, set to not unique so etl uh, jobs cannot update this value okay with not unique so i'll i'll go back to attributes uh, over here if i say now let's say i'll select this okay now once i click this save and after this i get the file within personalization it will throw an error saying that uh, this phone number you cannot uh, import it because etl jobs cannot update that value okay but if it is a custom attribute i can get that data easily uh, it's just that whenever you are using not unique you won't be able to uh, get the data in okay. i hope that answers the question yes yes akash so there's one more where uh, can we map more than one attribute to one identity type uh 
Yeah, it's actually uh, you can map one to one, but uh, I'm not sure why you would uh, map multiple. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think uh, like as a best practice, uh, what I've seen uh, in the documentation, it's recommended that you only have uh, one attribute map to one identity type. Yes. So pretty much she, these are all the questions. So there are some other questions, especially on uh, the IPs, uh, shared IPs and dedicated IPs, which is not part of the session, which we can already covered most of the questions. Um, I think uh, I think that's it, Akash. Thank you so much for joining with us today. And then thank you so much for the wonderful demo. I, I see most of the demo, especially on uh, data extract activities and uh, file export activities and all, but this is something very new. Uh, I don't see anywhere, especially on this, how we can do a complete demonstration on feed the data from marketing cloud to our interaction studio, which is which is quite good. Uh, completely new ETL feeds, especially uh, no one knows that ETL feeds available in interaction studio, but this does. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's pretty uh, easy actually when we are using that ETL yeah. data feeds. Uh, like I think I did a mistake in that automation. That's why we weren't able to see that data via automation, but I have tried that out uh, multiple times and that does uh, show up the user profiles as well. Yeah, what else if we don't commit it? I know this, we build an automation and then we automatically, the file will comes to an inbound, but, uh, and then once we commit that, it automatically loads up data into IS and then create a unified profile. But what else if I don't commit and then uh, how many days that, file will be stored inside in bond yeah uh, so it will be i think 60 days um, so the personalization F uh, sftp it uh, keeps the file for about 60 days so but if you are if you have already enabled the etl feed uh, there's uh, no way that you can go and stop that commit because it automatically as and when it sees that uh, file naming pattern right so yeah. if we have only username followed by date in that case, that file will be in inbound. It won't process it since that file matching is not there. But whatever files that you get in inbound, and if the ETL data feed is activated, it will automatically commit all the changes. But if you uh, want, uh, let's say if you have a file uh, in marketing cloud or in your system, and if I just want to test that file with before even going to uh, marketing cloud automation studio, in that case, I can manually test that files under uh, this feed dashboard over here. So I can first test that file. Uh, if I have any errors, I will I can see that errors. I can go ahead and uh, change uh, that error, and I can upload re-upload that file to see if there are any errors. So manual upload, it will uh, not commit unless you go and do that. But uh, when you get it through automation, and if the ETL data feed is enabled, it will. Uh, comment it automatically unless the file name does not match. Okay, so my another question would be like, uh, so ideally when I work with a lot of customers where, uh, you know, they have the data sitting in somewhere, which is third party, ideally there's no direct connection with uh, IS uh, to load the data into, you know, apart from the CTL feeds. But my question is, uh, so I have a file which is sitting outside of my system and I would like to load the data into IS platform to build the personalization, everything for my customers. Can we load the file, can we load the data into IS without an automation activity? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if, you're, if you're getting the data in SFTP, uh, mm -hmm. you can, uh, it will process the uh, data, whatever you're getting in. Uh, but again, uh, different depending on the systems uh, that we are using, uh, it will uh, depend. But in marketing cloud, uh, without uh, the automation, uh, I don't think there's an option where you can get it in SFTP. Because in SFTP, if you uh, notice, we also don't have any option over here to upload a file, right? So <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I just want to ask a blank question so that audience will definitely understand. So, so team, uh, without automation, I think whatever uh, Akash explains, so the process where we need to follow for uh, now inserting the data into IS platform with an ETL feed options. Yeah, and uh, if there's any uh, extra additional integration setup that you can do for a third party, you can use this option. Uh, so uh, I think uh, one more, uh, the, one important uh, capability of personalization is 
you can use this data uh, in your marketing cloud journey builder as well uh, but that again that's a different topic which will be covered in detail in the next sessions yes so there are a couple of as akash said teams there are a couple of topics especially on uh, uh, quite key uh, how we can load the data from different source system that will be covered under contact builder the upcoming sessions mm -hmm. and uh, yeah Thank you, Akash, for once again. It's a brilliant demo. Thank you so much. The explanation is very crystal clear. Thank you once again. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Prashant for a question again. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Akash.